Welcome to MRE Uncut, where we'll give you real and practical insights into the real estate scene in Melbourne. We'll discuss what's happening in the industry, all backed by MRE's history of over 30 years in the game. With that said, let's jump into this week's episode of MRE Uncut. Welcome back to another MRE podcast. My name's Stephen Fitzsimon, and today I'm joined by Sinead Petropoulos, one of our marketing gurus. Hello. And Matt Hale, who's the director of Rising Tide. Morning, Steve. Morning, Sinead. Thanks for coming in, Matty. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, today, Sinead's going to run the show, I think, pretty much. She told me today, so I'm listening. I did. Um, but we wanted to talk to Matt again because you, your exposure that you've got into the um, young investors, young property buyers of today. Um, Sinead, go for it. Yeah, well, I think when I met you last time, I was thought to myself, wow, I'm talking to someone who's in a similar position as me. We've both got young children. Um, we've got investments, but, you know, we're, we're not loaded. We're just going by. We've got school fees to pay. We've got childcare to pay for. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the misconception or perhaps that people my age have about building wealth through property. Let's go. <laughs> so basically, what are some of the biggest misconceptions with, you know, building a property portfolio? Firstly, I think when it comes to investing in property, people think that all properties go up and that all property growth is linear. In our experience, you can be really lucky to have that happen, but it's more in line with investing for the long term uh, and obtaining the capital growth that way rather than thinking that you can buy something, you know, the terms like flip it, buy and sell, move from suburb to suburb. It just doesn't happen. It's fascinating, isn't it? Like a, it, it, when you read a bit in the press about people picking on landlords, I, I always think of, I know a heap of landlords that have bought and have lost money and have been negatively geared the whole time. And negative geared is just another word for losing money. Um, and if you're not getting capital growth, then you've got nothing to claim the tax deduction on other than your own money that you've earned and lost. Yeah, it's a really big risk to expect growth to happen just because, mm. but particularly when you are negatively geared. And I think at the moment, it's a great exposure to the risk that people have inadvertently taken on. Interest rates are now at 6% versus 2% a few years ago. On a million dollar mortgage, that's potentially another $40,000 of interest each year. After tax. After tax. Yeah, it's brutal. 800 bucks a week. Yep. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's a significant, it's a significant challenge. Okay. So what would your advice be for young families who maybe they've saved up They've got their first home, but now they are looking to expand. Like what strategy should they put in place? I think the first strategy that young families in particular should take is to think about the next 10 to 15 years, not the next 10 to 15 months. So many people get antsy when they feel like they've done the hard work to save up or to be able to get some help from their parents, whether it be, you know, a guarantor loan, and then they buy but so often we see two to five years in, they realize that the house that they bought wasn't what they needed for the next chapter. It might not be close to schools. It might not have a big enough backyard. It might not have enough bedrooms. And then they're faced with having purchased a property. They then have selling costs. They then have more stamp duty. And then they don't necessarily have as many options as they would have the first time around. Oh, especially if they borrowed at 2% the first time around and then they got to borrow at 6%. The yeah. second time around. And the other thing that we often see is that the first time people buy, it might be when they don't have kids, might be two full-time incomes, or it may be one child, but the more kids you have and the more non-full-time workers you have in the house, the lower your borrowing capacity is, which can really impact people next. Can you go into that a little bit more, like give some dummy figures to sort of like highlight how that changes. Cause I think a lot of people would go into the circumstance of, okay, um, we're double income, no kids. So we've bought an apartment or we've bought our first two bedroom house in Brunswick. Right. And then they've moved in there and they've done a little bit of improvements to it and that type of thing, but they've still got a pretty hefty mortgage. 
they, they pop out a couple of kids and then they're like, oh, hang on, this two-bedroom house is a bit shy. We'll go a bit further north or we'll we'll move somewhere where we need to still borrow a little bit more money but not too much. And, and then um, – and they've got their existing mortgage that they took out on the on the house because you know the first few years they're just basically paying interest, and and so they step it out a bit. They need to borrow another two or three hundred, and um, and then they're facing this challenge of um, looking for a loan and having all these additional burdens. How, how often are you seeing that happening, and and how are they struggling in terms of getting the loan approvals? Yeah. We see this a lot where particularly people aren't thinking about the next chapter, but they're also not thinking about the impacts that their decisions might have on the next chapter. And if you think about it, when you're looking to buy a property, there's sort of two boxes you need to tick and you need to tick both of them. It's not one or the other. It's the deposit and then it's the servicing. So have you got enough to start with? And that can come through cash or you could sell shares or it could be borrowed from parents or a guarantor loan. But then can you actually service the loan? And that's the bank looking at two major things. What is your total income in the family? And then what do you spend? And whether you are the most frugal family or not, it actually doesn't matter because there are predetermined numbers around what banks will say that let's say for Annie and myself, we've got two small kids at a home in Brunswick. They will attribute a certain level of spend to us when it comes to our loan servicing, even if we don't spend it. So to your question, Steve, what happens is people think they are always going to be able to borrow more. They might've paid off some of their home. Yep. They might've added some extra um, capital value by doing uh, renovations, but that doesn't necessarily stack up in the bank size. And then the other thing that a lot of people don't take into consideration is the valuation. So Event, if you want to hold on to that property as an investment and then go buy again, there's a whole lot of tax implications, which we can go into on another day, but also the bank still needs to value your house at enough to be able to use the equity in there. Right. So what are the strategies to kind of overcome, you know, the financial of the savings and then figuring out servicing multiple loans at one time? I think the first it's not necessarily a strategy, but the groundwork that people need to do is very first and foremost, have really clear goals, not just for the first chapter, but for the second and the third, mm -hmm. and then really get to know their numbers. And when I talk about their numbers, it's what's coming in mm -hmm. and what's going out. What are your commitments? And then start to create some really clear goals and also come to grips with what those timeframes might be. We often hear people, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had a call from someone and they said, you know, we've got our probably 10% deposit. Do we put it into crypto and try to double it in three months? Wow. I said, well, it's not what I would recommend. Um, it's probably a lot higher risk than what most people would want to do, but you've got to be comfortable with the risk that you're taking on. So what we see, Sinead, is a lot of people will get clear around what they want to do, where they want to buy, and then they will really bunker down. And if the goals are really purpose-led, those sacrifices become a little bit easier. But people then need to invest. We see a lot of people investing in Australian shares and international shares because you can do it a bit more bit pieces rather than a big lumpy deposit and then plan out that growth to then be able to liquidate, to have that as their deposit down the track. But it requires patience. It's not an overnight fix. You know, if you think about 30 or 40 years ago when our parents were buying, the average property was three to four times what they were earning. Now you might be looking at eight to 10 times. So it's just going to take longer. It's painful, isn't it? I, th that's the consideration that we don't sort of grasp. You know, if, yeah. if, if your parents were buying something that was three or four times, that's like looking at a, a sort of a house now for 350 grand and, and they don't exist and they haven't existed for a long time. And then you're sort of tied to massive amounts of debt, which impacts you significantly for the, your capacity to pay it down impacts your lifestyle because obviously you've got less money to be able to spend on day-to-day -day activities, day-to-day -day things. Um, and, and yet, uh, you're, you're sitting there comparing your own personal performance against that of your parents. And they're sitting there, you know, it's just, it's just natural. Do you know what I mean? you sort of, and then you're, you're there sitting there being able to buy another investment property because of the fact that, well, 
the maths was different. Yeah, and I think what we see is trying to be really empathetic on both sides of the fence. Our parents, a lot of them were more willing to make sacrifices. Yeah, that's you know, true. You hear the avocado on toast, the $6 soy latte, all that sort of stuff. So I think there is relevance in that. Definitely. And then on the flip side, I think something that hurts the generations now is the six, 800,000 square metre blocks that will inevitably grow mm. from a capital perspective aren't as prevalent as what they used to be. I sort of look at my parents but bought 45 years ago on a um, block out in one Turner with no services nearby or anything. So there was a, a general uh, growth, but a lot of people that are buying now are buying in pre-planned estates where some of that capital growth has already been taken into consideration when they buy. But I think a lot of people are ignorant to that. Yeah, yeah, and when do you start seeing growth in those estates, and and especially now, like I think the challenge that you've got when they, when they've bought in those estates now is if the internationals have bought in those estates and now they're getting lump land tax bills, which are horrific. Well, they're gonna, well, a few of them sell are gonna up. sell, and and then you then you're facing with sales in a similar property in a similar area. It brings me back to the pains of investors in high rise apartment buildings. We're trying to maximize outcomes from those ones. It's 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 a tough spot. All right, my next question, because this is something I'm guilty of doing all the time and I get on George's nerves. I'm constantly on um, realestate.com and I'm just trying to, you know, calculate how much equity I've made, thinking that it's kind of like free money in a sense, because I can potentially do more with it. What um like how important is it to have a solid financial plan instead of doing what I do and looking at REA all the time? Yeah. The age-old saying of fail to plan and you plan to fail, I think it rings true. What we certainly see though is that when people have a, a good, strong plan, mm -hmm. they become less antsy, it's less reactive and it's more proactive, but also they find a way to be a bit calmer, a bit more zen. And therefore, they're waiting for the opportunities that will eventually pop up, but they also know how they're progressing. Mm -hmm. uh, they can also benchmark against what they said they were going to do versus broad sweeping statements that you read in the paper. And what I mean by that is if you and George sit down at the end of, or let's say at the end of the month and go over the next 12 months, we are likely to spend this much over the next 12 months. We're likely to earn. We expect our super contributions to be this. We expect to spend this much on insurance. We can then come back if we're tracking that at the end of the year and say, hey, look, all of these things are great. You know, you guys earned more than what you said you were going to do. Your property's gone up. We do have more equity. But often there's one or two things where there may be some accountability required. And it may be that, you know, you guys didn't know that the budget was going to change and your childcare subsidy was going to go down or because of those extra earnings. And we can start to break it down. And then that gives you an opportunity to really work and focus on the things that will help you achieve rather than waiting for an auction up the road, feeling like that your place has gone from 1.8 to 1.9 or 1 to 1.1 and it's all just a guess. I would say mine's going down. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like that at the moment. I just, you know, again, like I mentioned before, we've got two investment properties in Queensland, which is, you know, an amazing blessing. But then I'm still sitting at home and I'm like, I don't like my kitchen. It's the original from the 1960s house. And I think my own personal timings, I get frustrated with that. And so and that would be disastrous. <laughs> if we were sitting down, that conversation would then come back to what are the goals? Yeah. Um, investing in property or even upgrading, you know, investment properties through renovation or subdividing or whatever it might be, their strategies. Um, if you and George sort of sit down and say, hey, our, one of our key goals is to get a new kitchen, then we would start to look at what are the strategies that are achievable. Um, but the earlier you can start to get those goals out on the page, the better it is. Um, and sometimes when I, I talk about Mr. Squiggle, I get blank looks from our younger clients, but but hopefully you guys might sort of know or remember it. Completely upside down, Miss Jane. Exactly. So what, what we have to deal with when we come <laughs> in is that people have – stuff on the page already, whether it's the investment properties or it's the kids. But what we try to do is help them visualize and articulate what they want that piece of paper to look like. And then we get to drawing through the strategies and, and eventually it does come to fruition, but it takes patience. And it also takes the, 
I suppose the real depth of getting into what you both want to achieve, and particularly for a couple, it can be quite hard to nearly put yourselves out on the line to say, we want to achieve this because of the fear of failure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And then you've also got to have tough conversations because whatever you might want to achieve might differ and it might not have been something that's come up in conversation too often. Steve, you're absolutely spot on. We talk about there's three real philosophies that will help people get from A to B. The first one is what we'd call the plan B or the contingency. That's the stuff that no one wants to talk about. It's the life insurance, the wills, the buffer in your cash account, all that sort of stuff. The second one is your cash flow structures. And then the last one is your investment philosophy. And that's the risks that you're willing to take. Those are the really hard conversations, the trade-offs, and that all then flows into the goals. But if people don't have their goals, all of that stuff feels like you're just on a bit of a merry-go-round and you're not going to make headway because you can't actually articulate whether you're on track for success. Yeah, I like that. So A, B, and C, sit down and have that conversation with your partner tonight as a starting point, and then plan off the back of that. Yeah. If you head to our website, shameless plug, yeah. um, <laughs> rising tide, what's, the, what's the website? Risingtidefinancial.com.au. Go to the new client resources. Yeah. There is a wonderful, simple one pager and a great video by one of my colleagues, Rebecca Pritchard. I always say, choose your poison, whether it's coffee, glass of red, or a block of chocolate. Sit down with yourself um, or and or your partner, if you have one, and start to plan it out. And those goals will then start to dictate some of the decisions that you make, but also more importantly, the sacrifices that you're comfortable making because a purpose-led goal will always be better than a willpower-driven decision. Yeah. Are you able to share a success story from one of your clients at Rising Tide? Yeah. Look, we've got a lot of success stories, but the one underpin of them is patience Mm -hmm. and looking after those three things, doing the boring stuff first The same way that when people buy a house, do the foundations, that's the plan B, the contingency, really clear goals. I think, you know, one of the, when it comes to property, one of the great success stories that we've had um, is a young couple who have now had kids and now moved down into their dream home. But at that point in time, they wanted to purchase, they were living in Collingwood. They wanted to purchase a townhouse in Collingwood. It's where they wanted to be for the next three to five years. When we sat down and did the numbers with them, it actually worked out to be more convenient for them, cheaper in terms of um, stamp duty, land tax, all this sort of stuff. But they eventually worked out that their dream home was down in Mount Martha. That is so far from Collingwood. So far from Collingwood. And the biggest thing, they were only thinking (laughs) thinking about the next chapter when they didn't have kids. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, their current chapter. But then as soon as you said, hey, think forward, if you're lucky enough and you choose to have two kids, where do you want to be? And it was crystal clear. But yep. they were at the time only thinking about working in Richmond and the city and this sort of stuff. So they were able to buy that property at today's prices, rent it out, continue renting in, in Collingwood. Collingwood. Mm-hmm. And they inevitably actually, what we find is once people have done that work, things start to come to fruition a lot quicker. Um, those are the types of things that really strong planning and starting to lift your eyes a bit and look a little further into the future than what you currently do. And when I talk about the future, if you talk to your family and friends, they talk about long-term being one, two, three years. We think about seven, 10, 15, 20. So when you're doing that goal planning, think of it in that long-term 20-year time frame and see how that changes the conversations you have with your partner. Such a long time. But even like, you know, my daughter's six and I sometimes think and I'm like, I can't imagine six years ago when you weren't here. Like it is a quick amount of time, I guess. It's like that linear Time projection. flies, mate. Time yeah. flies. I'm yep. sure the teenagers Before you know will be they're quick. In, they're in secondary yeah. school. So we're going to the website to start the planning, you know, in a, in a practical sense. We, we've done we, – We that's great if you're starting off. So if you're – when you know, when do you, when do you suggest starting to plan for, the, for that sort of investment in property journey? Because I look back on my mates. I've got one mate. He bought a property when he was 19. I still hate him, right? Um, it was ninety one thousand um, uh, dollars, you know, and he's my age. So, I, I sort of, I, I sort of look at that as one part of a, of an investment journey, and I'm sort of like, oh, the sooner the better. But um, but I'm sort of like looking at it. Okay, what do you then need to sacrifice? How much of that do you want to sacrifice in terms of life experience and uh, because you've got a debt that you've got to service and you've got a yeah, you know, like all this sort of stuff. So I'm sort of when do you when when should somebody if they're out there or if they're listening to this and they've got kids or nephews who are in their early twenties, 
is is now when those guys should start planning, or are they have they are they all right to continue mucking around until they get the real proper first job? I think getting in the mindset of looking ahead is what we're trying to advocate for. Because too often, especially these days, people, even when they purchase earlier, they don't necessarily do it with a lot of uh, confidence that they're doing the right thing. It relies on a bit of luck. And we're seeing more and more people not getting that capital growth that that maybe people who purchased at 19 did years ago. So start early, start having the conversation, start thinking about you know what your career looks like, what your earning capacity might be, and have really clear goals around that because that will dictate what you can buy and when. But also something that we talk about a lot is don't think that because you're putting goals down that they can't move, they can't Mm. change. We have never once seen someone get to the achievement of a goal or have the resources to be able to do it, have the cash flow to do something they wanted to do and then change their mind and be disappointed that they've got all this capital or this extra cash flow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think think that's, that's... That's sort of where you got to see. It's not going to hurt you to start planning now. It's not going to hurt you, but also as well by, you know, educating yourself. I think, you know, if people can start to find the voices that they trust that resonate with them, and then it it doesn't even need to be as official as it used to be. I look at a lot of the clients that we take on, you know, over 90% of our clients are between the age of 30 and, and 54. A lot of them haven't purchased their first property yet, but to your point, Steve, I suppose they're ready they're ready to start adulting, for want of a, a better word. Mm. Uh, but I bet my bottom doll that if you asked any of them if they would like to have started earlier, That's a yes. it'd be a resounding yes. Yeah, fascinating. Matty, absolutely fantastic. Great to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Thank you. 